Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. This week I'm going to uh, speak to you about one of my favorite saints. This included in our uh, series which will be entitled Lessons from My Favorite Saints. I'm going to speak about uh, Padre Pio, St. Pio of Pietrocina. Uh, many of you are uh, familiar with Padre Pio, uh, certainly uh, he was very well loved uh, long before he was canonized a saint. He is a saint of our times. You see on the, the desk here, I have a little picture of him. Uh, many of you uh, have sent me uh, mass cards and prayer intentions and, and letters uh, um, wishing me uh, you know, a quick recovery from my illnesses. And uh, this one happens to be from... Uh, the uh, monastery where uh, Padre Pio was for his uh, entire life uh, as a Capuchin Franciscan. Uh, two passages of scripture that really sum up the life of, of uh, St. Pio, both from St. Paul. Far be it from me to glory in anything except in the cross of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, that's from Galatians 6.14. And then uh, my favorite one, which I, I think also uh, truly summarizes uh, the life and ministry of Padre Pio, St. Pio. Uh, it is now my joy to suffer for you as I fill up in my own poor human flesh that which is yet to be fulfilled in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. And that's uh, a, a tremendous uh, passage from Colossians uh, 124 and following. I think that was, you could call that the central uh, gospel text, not gospel, but uh, New Testament text uh, in my doctoral thesis, which was on the meaning of human suffering in the teaching of Pope John Paul II. Let me read to you right from the uh, the monastery that knew Padre Pio the best, the place where he lived. It says, St. Pio was born of simple, hard-working farming people on the 25th of May, 1887, in Pietrelcina, southern Italy. He was tutored privately until his entry into the Capuchin Friars at the age of 15. Uh, always of feeble health, but strong will, with the help of grace, he completed the required studies and was ordained a priest in 1910. On 20th of September, 1918, the five wounds of our Lord's Passion appeared on his body, the stigmata, uh, making him the first stigmatized priest in the history of the church. Countless uh, numbers were attracted to his confessional, and many more received his saintly and spiritual guidance through correspondence. His whole life was marked by long hours of prayer and continuous austerity. His letters to his spiritual directors reveal the ineffable sufferings, physical and spiritual, which accompanied him through all of his life. They also reveal his very deep union with God, his burning love for the Blessed Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, and worn out by over a half a century of intense suffering and constant apostolic activity in San Giovanni Rotondo, he was called to his heavenly reward on the 23rd of September, 1968. Uh, he was um, canonized on the 16th of June, 2002, uh, and um, by Pope John Paul II. So, oh, Padre Pio, Saint Pio, uh, a magnificent saint, a man of our times, a saint of our times. Now, in the very brief time that I have, uh, I, I, I can't say a whole lot. I'm just going to try to give you a little, a little um, summary of Padre Pio, what he teaches us, the essence of his life. He probably, for me, 
was the single most important saint uh, in most of the years, especially the early years of my vocation. Uh, he was a great father uh, and protector of my vocation. He helped me a great deal. He inspired me a great deal. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to talk about uh, the essence of Padre Pio and the lessons that we can learn from his life. Uh, he was a man of great prayer and suffering. Uh, although he really never left uh, the monastery, the friary where he was after he went in there, uh, he affected the whole world. Millions and millions of people uh, were touched by Padre Pio, by his life, his holiness, his apostolic work. Uh, his entire life is wrapped up in his vocation, number one, as a Franciscan friar, a Capuchin friar, number two, as a, as a priest. And these are very much uh, interconnected. You know, throughout the years, I've, I've uh, witnessed some of the um, stuff written about St. Francis. Um, and to be honest with you, a lot of it doesn't ring true. Um, sometimes the only thing we get from some of the contemporary versions of the life of St. Francis is, he, he's the kindly little man with the birds in the garden. Uh, well, he certainly was a, a gentle man, a, a man that the, even the animals and birds responded to because of his great holiness. But Padre Pio, more than anything, uh, was the, the living image of Jesus Christ, um, which, by the way, is a good working definition of what a saint is. Padre Pio made present Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, we're all created in the image and likeness of God, and um, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is Jesus. Padre Pio became more and more like Jesus in his time on earth. Uh, he loved God, and then out of that love for God, he loved souls. He loved all of humanity. He had great compassion, great empathy uh, for all human suffering. Uh, one of his great works was, a, was basically a, it's a spiritual work, but also a temple work, uh, where both the spiritual and temple works of mercy are manifested in his house for the relief of suffering. It's a great medical facility uh, that he built. And, um, he, he cared about those who were sick and suffering, and, and he met... Um, so many thousands of them and prayed for them and suffered for them. And also those who uh, suffered morally and spiritually, he had great compassion uh, for them as well. In his whole life was uh, an offering, an oblation to God, a sacrifice to God for the salvation of souls. Uh, we see this uh, manifest in his... Uh, uh, living out of the priesthood. Um, number one, uh, his great love for the Mass. Uh, that was the center of his existence. Uh, um, indeed, it, the Holy Eucharist is the source, the center, and the summit of the Church's life. And it should be of every single member of the Church. It certainly was for Padre Pio. It was the source, the center, and the summit of his very existence. He lived to celebrate the Holy Mass each day, and he did it with such great, great reverence. Um, in addition to that, uh, the confessional. He certainly was a saint uh, of the confessional. He spent long, long hours in the confessional, um, uh, absolving people from sin, setting captives free. Uh, Jesus, the high priest, working through the ministry of his servant and saint, uh, Padre Pio. And um, so many thousands would go, you know, there he was in the monastery, which he never left. He didn't go out preaching. Um, he, he was um, pretty much uh, not, not strict in closure, but he, he was in the monastery, and he was basically didn't, didn't leave it, except on very rare occasions um, uh, to visit his parents a, a, a couple of times. He, he'd go out to vote, by the way. Padre Pio would leave the monastery to go out to vote. He took very seriously uh, his civic obligation. 
Um, and in an election year, I'll just throw that in as a side note, take that very seriously. Uh, Padre Pio would certainly um, think well of that. So he was a priest of the Holy Mass, the confessional, uh, and, and of prayer. Um, he had a tremendous devotion to the rosary, great devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to the, um, uh, to the messages of Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima. He thought very highly of these messages, and um, Our Lady exhorted us to pray the rosary, and Padre Pio prayed many rosaries every day. The uh, story has been frequently told that every now and then Padre Pio would yell out to the brothers, Bring me my weapon! Bring me my weapon! And they said, Father, your weapon? What weapon? My rosary! My weapon! A powerful weapon against evil. And so it was that he waged war on behalf of souls against the devil. You see, in the life of Padre Pio, as in the lives of so many saints, we see reality manifest. Now, today, this reality has often been uh, obfuscated, it's been diminished and distorted, but reality is not merely physical reality, not merely psychological reality, it's also spiritual reality. If you bracket out spiritual reality, you've bracketed out most of reality. Now God is pure spirit. You eliminate God, who is being itself, and then try to draw conclusions about being, <laughs> uh, good luck, you're not going to make it. But you see, in the life of Padre Pio, we see reality as it truly is manifest. Now what I mean by that the reality of good and evil, the reality of angels and of demons. A fierce combat swirled around Padre Pio. Uh, he, he was a great warrior, like his Holy Father, St. Francis, uh, who was at the beginning of his vocation shown that he would have to do combat with this horrible monster who was Satan. Uh, so Padre Pio, from the very beginnings, of his religious and priestly vocation, he had frequent battles with the enemy. Uh, this is not pious fiction. Uh, this is not devotional nonsense. This is rock-solid doctrine uh, evidenced in the life of a saint. Uh, and he's not the only saint that had these kinds of things. This is real. Heaven and hell are real. Good and evil are real. Satan and the fallen angels and the good angels, that's real. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. We believe this. You must believe this. If you refuse to believe this or doubt this, then God forbid you'd be classified as a heretic. That's part of what we believe in the doctrine of the faith. I'll guarantee you if you'd have lived in Padre Pio's shoes, you'd have believed it because he lived through it. How many times he suffered the assaults of the evil ones, at times even physically. This is an unusual thing. It's not an everyday thing. Uh, it's most likely not going to happen to you or to me, but it happens, and it happened to Padre Pio. Uh, it, it was a, uh, a manifestation of the hidden spiritual battle that goes on for souls. Uh, Padre Pio's life really demonstrates to us the essence of this battle. Now, sure, we, we know some of it now. Uh, some of us, like me, we go out and we preach, and that's a good thing. We use the two-edged sword of the Word of God. That's a powerful weapon uh, for the salvation of souls. Padre Pio, through his uh, fervent, uh, zealous, and uh, very reverent celebration of the Holy Eucharist, uh, through his um, very efficacious hearing of confessions constantly, uh, minute after minute, month after month, year after year, thousands and thousands of confessions, reconciling souls to God. That, that's a great weapon, a fantastic weapon, powerful weapon against evil, confession. Uh, and then, possibly the greatest weapon of all, the cross of Christ. You know, when Jesus came to break 
the stranglehold of evil on humanity. Uh, he really didn't do it as a preacher. He didn't do it as a king. He didn't do it as a prophet. Uh, although all of those things contribute and are very important. He did it as a savior. And the way he did this was from a cross. Uh, pain and suffering ordained toward resurrection. Uh, it's the priesthood. It's the essence of the priesthood. The old covenant priesthood. All the pagan priests, priesthoods. That, you know, all these religions, uh, whether the uh, old covenant religion of the chosen people, or the many different pagan religions, they all had a priesthood. And the substance of the old priesthood was the same. They offered a vicarious sacrifice uh, in atonement for sin or to appease their god or gods. Now, in the fullness of time, when God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it, that's Galatians 4.4, 4, it changed. The priesthood changed in essence. Uh, we have a, a coming to full stature of the authentic priesthood. Uh, and what that is, is the priest, now there's only one priest in the new covenant priesthood, you know, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the high priest. Every other priest, whether the ministerial priest like Padre Pio or myself and all the other ministerial priests we have, or the royal priest uh, of the faithful, the royal priesthood, that's all taken up in the one priest, Jesus Christ. And so the sum and substance of that is the priest, Jesus, offers sacrifice, but it's not a vicarious sacrifice. The, uh, the priest offering is also the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So, priesthood and victimhood become one in the, in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And you see, Padre Pio lived this um, so perfectly, uh, the priesthood. Um, he offered sacrifice, first and foremost, the sacrifice uh, of Calvary, which we make present, the very same sacrifice made present in the holy sacrifice of the Mass in an unbloody manner. He made certainly that sacrifice as a priest, but he also incorporated himself, the sacrifice of himself. Uh, every moment of his life, all that he was, all that he did, everything was taken up in Jesus Christ, the high priest and Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So priest and victim become one in Jesus. And Padre Pio lived this to the fullest. Um, he had the stigmata for 50 years. And, and by the way, uh, he wasn't canonized a saint because he had the stigmata. Um, as a matter of fact, when saints have these mystical uh, phenomenon, it take, usually takes longer for them to be canonized. Now, Padre Pio was canonized fast, uh, as those things are counted in the church, uh, very, very quickly, because there's great holiness, so many witnesses to it, so much fruit uh, from his life. Um, but uh, he wasn't canonized because of, of charisms. Um, a charism is one thing. Holiness is another. Saints are canonized because of heroic virtue. And so it was with Padre Pio. The exercise of heroic virtue. Uh, he prayed. He suffered. Uh, he engaged in, in work for the salvation of souls. Long, long hours in the confessional. Um, there are so many stories uh, about Padre Pio. He had a good sense of humor, you know. Uh, there are a lot of funny stories. I've known several people, by the way, who personally had met Padre Pio or, or knew him very well. Um, I recall fondly a uh, uh, a gentleman that I knew when I was in the seminary, at Holy Apostle Seminary, uh, Joe Peterson. Uh, he knew Padre Pio, met him during the war, as many did during World War II. And uh, Joe was a mailman. And uh, every summer he'd take uh, his vacation to go over to Italy to visit Padre Pio. Uh, he was a mailman in Yonkers, New York, and Joe would take his, um, I think, a month off every summer He'd fly over and, and, he'd, and he'd visit Padre Pio uh, at the friary over there. And Joe told me many stories uh, about his um, acquaintance and friendship with, 
with Padre Vida. He gave me a first-class relic, actually, one time. I treasure it to this day, a piece of a, a glove from Padre Pio and some of the blood from the wounds of his hand. And uh, that's certainly something that uh, I'll always uh, treasure. But uh, Padre Pio had a great sense of humor, too. I remember uh, one of my, another one of my favorite saints, St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, her name in religion, she had a great sense of humor. And she used to say, um, God deliver us from somber saints. Uh, she had a sense of humor, too. And Padre Pio uh, was always, uh, uh, he manifested that sense of humor. One time a woman, people used to you know, want to uh, talk to him or, uh, or be blessed by him, which is understandable. One time uh, a woman uh, waited for him for, for hours, and uh, she uh, basically waited to ambush him in a corridor coming out of the friary end of the church. And um, she was all dressed up. She was a rather well-to-do woman, dressed up in all kind of finery and jewelry. And uh, she ambushed Padre Pio on his way to the, the, the church, and, and she said, Padre Pio, today is my birthday. I'm 80. Say something to me. And he looked at her intently, and he said, death is near. And he walked off to the church. <laughs> it was, he, he, uh, he did indeed have a, uh, a sense of humor, and there are many stories uh, like that from the annals of Padre Pio. Um, you know, the, um, he had, a, as I mentioned, a great love for the rosary. He said so many rosaries. He had a tremendous devotion to the Blessed Mother. Uh, I am not familiar with any saint that didn't have great devotion to the Blessed Mother. And I'll go beyond that. Not just devotion, relationship. Padre Pio had a real relationship with the Mother of God. She was his mother, just like she's our mother. He interiorized that, though. She helped him uh, from, from his infancy. Uh, through so many trials, through so much suffering, all the combat with the devil. Uh, she was always there, and he had great love for her, great devotion. And uh, he manifests that devotion. You know, it's one thing to say you have devotion to the Blessed Mother. That's a great thing. I'm glad you do. But you need to have a relationship with her. Listen, if you have a relationship with her, um, you know, it's one thing to know where all of the the private revelations and apparitions took place and what she said here, there, and everywhere, that's okay. But better that you are like her. That's what's important. Number one, humility. She's the humble handmaid of the Lord. Uh, you know, practice humility. Um, prayer, pray her rosary. Padre Pio was a humble man, a simple man, and a prayerful man praying thousands and thousands of ro rosaries throughout the course of his life. It, it was indeed the gospel weapon which he used to do battle against the devil for the salvation of souls. We should do the, the same. Learn uh, from the saints. Learn from Padre Pio. What should you learn from Padre Pio? Well, that. Listen. Have great devotion to, the, to your mother. You say, well, I have a hard time with the Blessed Mother. Well, get over it. Never mind a hard time. She's your mother. Jesus gave her to us from the cross. The least we can do is accept her. Accept her. You know, uh, you should have a, a picture or a statue of Our Lady in your home. Listen, if she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for you and me. And, and it's as simple as that. Or some people say, oh, I don't want to pay too much attention to her. She gets in the way of Jesus. Hogwash! The mother doesn't get in the way of the son. The mother leads us to the son. How did Jesus enter time and space? How did the word become flesh and dwell among us? It was through the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came to us through Mary. Don't forget that. Jesus came to us through Mary. And if you, really, you want to know a, a secret in the spiritual life, go to Jesus through Mary. Padre Pio did this. Go to Jesus through Mary. You may say, well, I can go direct. I don't need her. Arrogance. Arrogance. You know? Uh, she is more pure 
and holy than I am or that you are. Mary is the mother of the Lord, and she's our spiritual mother too. Learn from the saints. Learn from Padre Pio. Have a great affection, a great love, a great devotion to the Blessed Mother, and pray her rosary. Do it every day. Uh, God only knows how much we need these prayers in our country, in our church, in the world today. So pray that gospel prayer. Pray the rosary. Have great devotion to the angels. Padre Pio had great devotion to the holy angels, especially to his guardian angel. Uh, he used to tell people, send, tell, send your guardian angel to me. You know, remember what an angel is. The word means messenger. They're messengers. The angels carry messages from God to us and from us to God in the form of thoughts. And so, uh, you know, if you're, if you're struggling, if you're in trouble, whether physical, uh, psychological, moral, spiritual, um, you know, sometimes you need to send out an SOS, right? Like a ship in distress uh, in a storm on the ocean. Um, I've often sent my guardian angel to Padre Pio. I've often done that. I've all, often uh, enlisted the help of St. Michael to protect me, uh, St. Gabriel to strengthen me, St. Raphael to heal me. Uh, these are the great archangels, of course. Padre Pio had tremendous devotion to the angels. The angels are real. The angels have a powerful part to play in this dour combat that each one of us has to wage against the forces of evil. This is reality. Uh, you know, a good working definition of sanity is to be in touch with reality. If you're out of touch with God and things as they relate to God, spiritual thing, then you're out of touch with reality. And, and you're, you know, you might not be all there. <laughs> so let's get in touch with reality. Padre Pio is a shining example of love for souls that comes from love for God. First of all, he loved God above all things for his own sake. That interchange of love gave him the power. It capacitated him to love souls, to love individual human beings with his whole heart, mind, and strength. He cared about people. He cared about individual human beings and all their sufferings. And you know, people do suffer so much. Uh, the longer I live, uh, the more I become aware of there's so many things a human being uh, has to suffer. You know, we've got physical things. Um, sure, some people far more than others. Um, psychological things, uh, psychological sufferings, emotional sufferings can be every bit or more painful even than physical. Depression, anxiety, um, and certainly moral sufferings, the, the battle with sin that goes on throughout uh, the course of a human life, um, the spiritual sufferings. Padre Pio understood it because he went through all of it. He understood physical suffering. Listen, <laughs> he, had the, he, he had many sufferings through his life. He used to get high fevers that would break the thermometer. Um, but after all, he had the, the, the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. You know, sometimes people ask, what are they? Well, they're real, the real wounds, nail holes, real holes in his hands and his feet and in his side, the five wounds of Christ. He had them. <clears throat> One time, someone said to Padre Pio, said, do they hurt? And he looked at, he looked at the guy in amazement and he said, what well, do you think, they're decorations? Another time, uh, on the 50th anniversary of Padre Pio receiving the stigmata, they had a big party for him at the monastery. And a man came up to him, well-meaning, and said, uh, Oh, Padre Pio, may you have 50 more. And Padre Pio looked at him in horror and said, What did I ever do to you? You know, 50 more years of pain in his hands and his feet and his side. Well, it was for a reason. Uh, he suffered physically. He suffered the, the, the physical sufferings of Jesus on the cross. And he suffered the abandonment that Jesus suffered on the cross. The Father never, in fact, abandoned his Son on the cross. But Jesus was allowed to feel, to experience total abandonment. 
My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Those are really the words of the psalm. Uh, the father hadn't abandoned him, but he was allowed to suffer that darkness of soul. And Padre Pio experienced that. So in, in uniting himself with Jesus Christ and him crucified, the power of redemption was channeled through Padre Pio to souls. And then souls received grace. The grace to repent of their sins, the grace to go to confession, the grace to go on and live a good life and become something beautiful for God. And that's the lesson from the life of St. Pio of Pietro Cina. May he intercede for every one of us and for our families. Uh, may he pray for us at the throne of God. And may we strive to be more like him as we too put one foot after the other in the journey of life. God love you, God bless you, and goodbye.